A long time ago, in a certain village, there lived a certain businessman. He was the richest man in the village. He was married with a son whom he loved unprecedentedly. He was a narcissist. He was proud. He was arrogant. He was selfish. He was never compassionate. He was never kind. He was never humble. He never loved people. He always put himself above other people. Whenever a member of the village had a problem and reached out to him for assistance, he would not be available to stand with them. He would instead tell them he was very busy with serious commitments. The elders of the village rebuked him many times because of his unbecoming behavior, but he would not listen. People would die, but he would not show up. People would be sick, but he would not show up. People would knock on his door, but he would not open it. Whenever people needed him, he would not show up. Behold, one day he returned from a business trip and his only son had died of an illness. He reached out to people to come and stand with him. However, to his surprise, not many people showed up. Most of the people told him his exact words. We are very busy with serious commitments. The man's words came back to haunt him. He cried like a baby. His wealth was there, but he needed more than his wealth at that particular time. He needed another kind of wealth, people. Unfortunately, he was so poor that he only had his wealth, but not many people in his life who could stand with him. He buried his son with only a handful of people. Rich as he was, he needed people to stand with him. There are things that money can never do for you. Money will never do for you what only people can do for you. Money is good. Resources are important. Wealth obtained genuinely is good. But there are things that wealth will never do for you. Even the wealthiest people in the world need people in many ways for many things. The rich man in the village never understood that he needed people for what his wealth could not do for him. People told him his exact words and the words humbled him. The words shocked him. The words haunted him. He ate his words. Have you ever eaten your words? Have your words ever humbled you? Have they ever struck you in the face? Be careful what you tell people who need your help, for you don't know when you will need their help. Be careful what you do to people who are beaten in life, for you don't know what they will do to you when they are beaten in life. Be careful how you treat people who are down today, for you don't know when you will be down yourself and you will need help. Be careful how you use your wealth, for you don't know when you could lose your wealth. Be careful how you relate with people, no matter how rich you are, for there are things that your wealth will never do for you, because only people can do them for you. Be careful how you respond to people who reach out to you for help, for they could respond to you the same way tomorrow when you reach out to them for help. Life is sinusoidal. Life is cyclic. Life is non-linear. The world is round. Mind whatever you do to people today, for it could come back to you in the same way or at least in some way tomorrow. We live in a selfish, self-centered and individualistic world where many people live on the philosophy of every man for himself, but God for us all. This is selfishness at its best. It cannot be the philosophy of a Christian. Any so-called Christian who, who lives based on this philosophy is nothing but a hypocrite. In the contemporary world, we see many people living in dehumanizing situations. You don't need anyone to tell you that in all parts of the world, people are suffering emotionally, physically, mentally, socially, spiritually, financially, and politically, among others. These people are hoping for someone to take the risk of helping them, perhaps through merciful actions. What do you do to those who are suffering? Do you show mercy to them? Do you reach out to them and help them in all ways within your means? What are you to those who are suffering today? What are you to humanity? What are you to the word of Christ? What are you to the afflicted? What are you to the social outcast? Are you a light in someone's darkness? Are you a rainbow in someone else's cloud? Are you the sunshine in someone's rain? What are you to those who are stripped, beaten, wounded, and left half dead as they journey through life? Are you a modern day Good Samaritan? Today I invite you to put your life in front of you and journey with me through the parable of the Good Samaritan. I must state up front that I do not claim to be a monopoly of wisdom. I do not claim authority on divinity. I do not claim to know anything. I am just a student of life. I am just a student of the word of God. I am just a student of divinity. 
I learned from everyone, everything and every situation. And then as a knowledge philanthropist, share what I learned with others to better their lives. I am not an authority on what I'm going to share with you. It is your duty to learn beyond what you will learn from what I will share. It is your duty to look for more information on what I will share with you today. It is your duty to seek more understanding of what I will share with you today. With that in mind, let's go on an expedition through the parable of the Good Samaritan. Follow me with your utmost attention. If you have never paid full attention during a sermon, then this is the time to do it. The sermon will be partly philosophical. Therefore, be open-minded as we examine the parable of the Good Samaritan. A parable is said to be an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. The parable of the Good Samaritan is very familiar to many people, including even non-Christians. On the 19th of September 2022, I shared a plane with a female Buddhist who amazed me when she told me the parable of the Good Samaritan in its entirety. I thought she was a Christian until she revealed to me that she was a conservative Buddhist. While the parable is familiar to many people, many people miss its point because they misunderstand it. Many people are familiar with the parable, but not its point. Today we will critically examine the parable of the Good Samaritan with our lives in front of us. What are you in the parable of the Good Samaritan? If you examine your life honestly, then you should surely find yourself in the parable. We will find out if we are the modern day Good Samaritans as we serve God. For starters, in fact for everyone, a Good Samaritan represents a person who does a good deed for someone in need. Particularly when he has not been asked for help and there is no reward for doing so. The parable of the Good Samaritan is found in the Gospel according to Luke chapter 10 from verse 25 to verse 37. It reads, On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law? He replied. How do you read it? He answered. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly. Jesus replied, do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. That is the parable of the Good Samaritan. Take a deep breath, fasten your seatbelt, and let's examine this parable with our lives before us. We are not going to condemn anyone in the parable. We are not going to judge anyone. We are not going to point a finger at anyone. But we will critically examine our lives to see what we are in the parable of the Good Samaritan. Have you ever wondered who your neighbors are? Who are your neighbors? Where do they live? How do you treat them? How do you know them? How do you meet them? What happens when you meet them? What do they look like? What are their races? The parable of the Good Samaritan brings us face to face with the wounded, those who wounded the wounded, those who by ignoring the wounded, father wounded him, and a man who bandaged the wounds of the wounded. The parable shows us how to become someone's neighbor, not how someone qualifies to be your neighbor. The parable demonstrates to us that anyone in need is our neighbor. You don't have to live with someone in the same place for you to be their neighbor. You don't have to be near someone to be their neighbor. You don't have to be with someone to be their neighbor. 
You don't have to know someone to be their neighbor. You don't have to be loved by someone to be their neighbor. You don't have to be cared for by someone to be their neighbor. You don't have to come from the same tribe as someone to be their neighbor. You don't have to be of the same color as someone to be their neighbor. You don't have to support the same political party as someone to be their neighbor. You don't have to be in the same church with someone to be their neighbor. You don't have to be in the same religion with someone to be their neighbor. Who are the modern day Good Samaritans? Do we still have Good Samaritans today? Are you a modern day Good Samaritan? Keep the last question in mind throughout the sermon. Put your life in front of you as we examine the parable. Are you a modern day Good Samaritan? The man traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho was stripped, beaten, wounded, and left half dead. What is the point here? The man was brought to the point of being completely unable to help himself. On his own, he could not survive. Only a heartless person would not have compassion for such a man. Have you ever been stripped, beaten, wounded, and left half dead as you journey through life? Has someone ever shown you mercy? Has someone ever found you in need but walked past you without attending to you? Have the people you thought would help you ever walked past you when you were in need? Has your enemy ever been good to you? Has someone ever poured wine and oil on your wounds? Has someone ever bandaged your wounds? Has someone ever put you on their donkey and walked as they led you to an inn for proper care? Has someone ever taken care of you when you were in need? Has someone ever fought a battle with you till the end? Have you ever been deserted by those you thought cared about you? Have you ever been let down by your friends? Have you ever stripped, beaten, wounded and left someone half dead on the highway of life? Have you ever robbed someone? In any way. Have you ever walked past someone in need? Have you ever helped someone in need? Have you ever poured oil and wine on someone's wounds? Have you ever bandaged someone's wounds? Have you ever put someone on your donkey and walked as you took them to an inn for proper care? Are you a modern day Good Samaritan? To understand the parable of the Good Samaritan, we need, to, we need to examine its context. The passage starts with an expert in the law testing Jesus by asking him the question, What must I do to inherit eternal life? The lawyer asked about eternal life. As Christians, we should all be concerned about eternal life and labor diligently for it in the vineyard of the Lord. The lawyer asked a very good question, but with a very bad motive. People can ask you questions for different reasons. People can ask you questions to know what they don't know. People can ask you questions to trap you. People can ask you questions to test if you know something. People can ask you questions whose answers they already know. But they want to first know if you know them so that otherwise they tell you. People can ask you questions to challenge you. People can ask you questions to point out the mistakes you have made. P people can ask you questions to show their wisdom, knowledge and intelligence. People can ask you the right questions for the wrong reasons. People can ask you the right questions for the right reasons. People can ask you questions for many reasons. The lawyer asked to test Jesus. He was not interested in eternal life at all. He was interested in trapping Jesus. He didn't ask the question with the right motive. He asked the right question, but for the wrong reason. His attitude was not right. He was a narcissist, so full of himself, so proud. Have you ever asked someone to test them? Have you ever asked the right question with the wrong motive? Have you ever asked someone with the wrong attitude? Has a question that you asked with the wrong motive ever backfired on you? The lawyer surely knew the law given that he was an expert in it. He also knew that the question was not an easy one to answer. That's why he asked it so that he could trap Jesus. If you are an expert in something, then you surely know it. The lawyer was an expert in the law, but not an expert in keeping it. <laughs> you can know a particular law, but that doesn't guarantee that you keep it. You can be an expert in laws without being an expert in keeping them. You can know the Bible from cover to cover, but that does not necessarily mean you obey it. Wisdom requires that we must not only know, but also do. The great German poet, novelist, and scientist Johann Wolfgang von Goethe said, Knowing is not enough, we must apply. Willing is not enough, we must do. Meditate on that statement for a moment. What must I do to inherit eternal life? The lawyer asked Jesus. 
This is a very powerful question. The lawyer asked the right question to the right person, but with the wrong motive. He was self-righteous, self-justifying and oblivious to his true condition. He was not in real understanding of his real condition. He thought he could earn eternal life through his religious activities. Jesus told him a parable that dissuaded his self-righteousness, self-affirmation and self-pride. In the end, he was surely convicted. Jesus responded smartly with two questions. What is written in the law? How do you read it? The Lord said, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. He combined Deuteronomy chapter 6 from verse 45 and Leviticus chapter 19 verse 18. He was an expert in the law. In verse 28, Jesus admitted that the lawyer answered correctly. The lawyer sought to justify himself and asked Jesus yet another question. And who is my neighbor? Verse 29. This is the question that triggered the parable. Now to understand the parable, we have to interpret it in light of the question, who is my neighbor? Keep that question in mind. Remember, it triggered the parable. The lawyer wanted to justify himself to prove that he was righteous, to show that he was observing the law well enough to earn eternal life. We have to study the parable in light of the question that ushered in the parable. Jesus started telling the parable of the Good Samaritan by saying, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Verse 30. What is the significance of that statement? The man was a Jew. The people listening to Jesus could easily identify with him. The Jericho Road connecting Jerusalem and Jericho is about 17 miles long. It was notoriously dangerous. In the about 17 miles, the road drops 3,600 feet. It is steep and winding and descends sharply with lots of rocky valleys and passes. History records that until the 5th century, it was called the Red or Bloody Way. Given the isolated terrain, people on this road were easy targets for bandits who would have found ample hiding places and escape routes into the desert where no one would pursue them. When Jesus said a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, his listeners surely recognized the dangers that the journey posed. A person stripped, beaten, wounded, robbed and left half dead on the road would surely be in a very vulnerable condition. They would be utterly exposed and isolated, desperate for help. Anyone coming upon such a man would not be able to easily avoid them, given the nature of the road. The lawyer asked an interesting trillion dollar question as he sought to justify himself. The Jews had a very shallow definition of who their neighbors were. To them, neighbors only included fellow righteous Jews. They did not include criminals. They uncleaned like the lepers, prostitutes, or their enemies. They hated those they considered not to be their neighbors. They even used some Old Testament passages to justify their hatred to exclude people from the term neighbors. For example, they cited Psalms 139 verses 21 and 22. Do I not hate those who hate you, Lord, and abhor those who are in rebellion against you? I have nothing but hatred for them. I count them my enemies. To the Jews, hatred for those they didn't consider to be their neighbors was a virtue. They erroneously believed that by hating those they hated, those they considered not neighbors, they were honoring God. And by not hating them, they would be dishonoring God. They specified who qualified as a neighbor. That way they narrowed the scope of whom to love. To reduce therefore the commandment to love your neighbor as yourself, correctly quoted by the lawyer, had a limited scope. Therefore, according to the lawyer, he had fulfilled the commandment, going by the narrow scope of the Jews' definition. Of who their neighbors were. Accordingly, the lawyer considered himself righteous and hence he sought to justify himself. He wanted to prove his righteousness by narrowing the scope of the law to a point where a human being could easily accomplish it. That is what many people try to do today. The problem is, it removes the need for a savior. If you can attain righteousness by your own works, then you don't need a savior. You don't need anyone to save you. You don't need God in your life. Therefore, you justify yourself. 
Jesus humbled the lawyer who thought he was righteous. We can read this parable of the Good Samaritan and easily criticize the lawyer. However, before criticizing him, look at yourself in the mirror. You may not be any better than the lawyer. <laughs> I told you to put your life in front of you. We should use the story as a mirror to examine ourselves. Is there a way in which you are like the lawyer? Do you justify or at least seek to justify yourself in some way? Do you feel righteous on your own accord? Are you the lawyer? Examine your life critically. Just like the lawyer, we sometimes overvalue knowledge, but don't play obedience. From the interaction between Jesus and the lawyer, we surely learn that knowledge is not enough. We need the right heart to do the right things with the right knowledge we have. To have the right heart, we need to submit totally to God and follow him with all our might. We have to allow him to be in control of our hearts. We have to obey God to have the right heart. The question is, is God in control of your heart? The question is, do you submit fully to God? The question is, are you obedient to God? The contrast Jesus made between the unloving Jews and the loving enemy, the good Samaritan, broke the preconceptions of the lawyer. The lawyer asked, who is my neighbor? In verse 36, Jesus asked the lawyer, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? Wow, what an eye-opening, soul-awakening, and soul-searching question. It is not other people's responsibility to qualify themselves to be our neighbors. It is our responsibility to be their neighbors. It is not up to other people to be worthy of our righteous works. It is up to us to do the righteous works. It is not up to other people to qualify for our love. It is up to us to love them. It is not up to other people to qualify for our services. It is up to us to serve them. It is not up to other people to qualify for our help. It is up to us to help them. The lawyer was confronted with the truth. He faced his hypocrisy. His justification was shattered. In his reply to Jesus in verse 37, the lawyer did not even mention the word Samaritan. He simply said, the one who had mercy on him. He could not even mention the name of his enemy. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. When the lawyer quoted the law to Jesus, in verse 27, Jesus told him, do this and you will live, in verse 28. In the beginning, Jesus said, do this and you will live. In the end, he said, go and do likewise. Now, go and do what exactly? Go and observe the law the lawyer quoted in verse 27. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus did not change his statement. What changed was the lawyer's perception of the law he quoted. The parable of the Good Samaritan was a lesson of mercy to the lawyer. Jesus rebuked the lawyer and confronted his self-justification and hypocrisy so that he could see them as they were. The lawyer had a true chance to change and start observing the law he quoted as he ought to observe it as demonstrated by the parable, not according to his limited understanding of it. There are many biblical lessons that we can derive from this parable. However, as we do so, we should not miss the point of the parable. The many lessons that can be learned from, from the parable should not sway us away from the context of the parable so that we don't miss the point of the parable. We should not miss the forest for the trees. The lessons are not the main points of the parable. They are just lessons from the parable. The parable is not a rationale for social justice. Now for starters, for those who may not be familiar, social justice is justice in terms of the distribution of wealth, opportunities, and privileges within a society. It is rooted in the idea that all people should have equal economic, political, and social rights and opportunities and treatment. Social justice is a good thing and is demonstrated explicitly by the Good Samaritan. But it is not the point of the parable of the Good Samaritan. The parable is about transformation, not charity. The main intention is that God's commands, whether the command to love or the command to obey, should lead us to desperation and transformation, not self-justification or self-affirmation. We should not think 
that by our own works we can attain eternal life. Therefore, we have no reason whatsoever for justifying ourselves. Any attempt to justify ourselves is erroneous, misguided, and fatal. When we realize that our own works cannot lead us to righteousness, no matter how good we think we are, we change, humble ourselves, and submit to God. We then get transformed. We can then love God with all our hearts and with all our souls and with all our strength and with all our minds and love our neighbors as ourselves. The lawyer thought he was properly observing the law, but Jesus showed him that he was not really observing it because his own understanding of the law was very shallow. On our own, we cannot observe the commandment. Only with God can we observe the commandment. Let's face it here. Who would do what the good Samaritan did with the heart with which he did it? given the nature of the wounded man and the fact that the Samaritans and the Jews hated each other. Who would do that? As we further examine the parable of the good Samaritan, you will have to find yourself in it. Who are you in the parable? Where are you in the parable? What meaning does the parable have for you? What are you doing on the highway of life? Are you the man who went down from Jerusalem to Jericho? Are you one of the robbers? Are you the priest? Are you the Levite? Are you the good Samaritan? Are you the innkeeper? Where are you on the highway of life? Are you in the position of the man traveling to Jericho from Jerusalem? Are you in a priestly position? Are you in a Levitical position? Are you in the position of the good Samaritan? Are you in the position of the robbers? Are you in the position of the innkeeper? Have you ever been a neighbor to someone? To how many people are you a neighbor? Do you know your neighbors? Who are your neighbors? What are your responsibilities to your neighbors? Are you a modern-day good Samaritan? What kind of Samaritan are you? Have you ever loved your enemies? Do you love both those who love you as well as those who hate you? How do you look at your enemies? Do you love those who don't look like you and don't act like you? Do you judge people for some reasons? Do you stereotype people for some reasons? Do you for some reasons consider some people to be better than others or serve people without discrimination? We meet people in need every day. We see them, but sometimes we just walk past them. The issue is not whether we see them or not, but what we do after seeing them. What do you do when you see someone in need? There are many people in need today. What will you do to them? Some people will seek your help. Will you help them? Some people will knock on your door. Will you open it for them? Some people will need you. Will you be there for them? Some people will look for you. Will they find you? Some people will not even ask for your help because they may not be able to do so. Will you still help them? Examine your life carefully today. Open your eyes widely and look around. Who are the people around you? What do they need that you can provide? What are their conditions? Will you reach out to them and help them? There are many people on the highway of life who have been stripped, beaten, wounded, and left half dead. Beaten by depression, beaten by wars, beaten by conflicts, beaten by disappointments, beaten by unemployment, beaten by the loss of loved ones, beaten by health problems, beaten by poverty, beaten by loneliness, beaten by discrimination, beaten by racism, beaten physically, beaten socially, beaten financially, beaten culturally, beaten emotionally, beaten mentally, beaten politically, beaten in many ways. Are you a neighbor to them? Have you ever cared? For the deaf, the blind, the alcoholic, the smokers, the social outcasts, the poor, the orphans, the widows, and the widowers among others. What are you to those people? Have you shared your love with those missing love? Have you been a spring of hope to the hopeless? Have you been a source of strength to the weak? What are you to the orphans? What are you to the widows? What are you to the widowers? What are you to the brokenhearted? What are you to the lonely? What are you to the poor? What are you to those suffering? What are you to those stripped, beaten, wounded, and left half dead on the highway of life? What are you doing to those who are poor? Spiritually, materially, socially, economically, culturally, and politically, among others. Have you provided shoulders for the downtrodden to lean on? Who are those leaning on your shoulders? 
Just like you lean on God's and other people's shoulders, so should other people lean on your shoulders. Just like you are loved by God and other people, so should you love other people. Just like you are helped by God and other people, so should you help other people. Just like you are shown mercy by God and other people, so should you show mercy to other people. Just like God and other people have compassion for you, so should you have compassion for other people. Just like your broken heart is mended by God and other people, so should you mend the broken hearts of other people. In a nutshell, just like God and other people are there for you, so should you be there for other people. The question is, are you there for other people? Do you stand with other people as and when you should? Do you have the will to help other people in all possible ways? It is wisely said, where there's a will, there's a way. The question is, do you have the will to help those who are stripped, beaten, wounded, and left half dead on the highway of life? Consider what is happening in your country. How many people are suffering? How many people are sleeping on empty stomachs? How many are homeless? How many are stripped, beaten, wounded, and left half dead? Emotionally, psychologically, economically, politically, socially, and culturally, among others. Who are the good Samaritans taking care of them? Are you one of the good Samaritans? What are you to those stripped, beaten, wounded, and left half dead in life? There are six categories of people in the parable of the good Samaritan. We will examine them one by one. As we do so, find where you belong. Put your life before you as we look at each category. Don't rush to judge anyone as we examine a parable. Rather, focus on your life and relate it to the life of each of the characters. Let's examine the characters one by one. We start our examination with the man himself, the one who left Jerusalem for Jericho. The man met robbers who attacked him and stripped him of his clothes. They beat him and went away when he was half dead. Have you ever been stripped, beaten, wounded, and left half dead on the highway of life? Are you wounded and distressed? Are you going down to Jericho from Jerusalem? Is there someone to help you when you are stripped, beaten, wounded, and left half dead on the side of the road? Are you the man stripped, beaten, wounded, and left half dead on the road to Jericho? Are you in need of help to survive through a situation? Are you the man going down to Jericho? From Jerusalem. Next, we look at the robbers. They met the man, stripped him, beat him, made him bleed, took off his, his possessions, and left him half dead. They didn't care about him, but they cared about his possessions, which they took away. As you track on the highway of life, some people will attack you. They will beat you up in life. They will strip off your clothes. They will make you bleed spiritually, emotionally, psychologically. Mentally, physically, politically, socially, economically, and in many other ways. They will leave you half dead. Spiritually, emotionally, physically, psychologically, economically, politically, mentally, socially, and in many other ways. They don't care about who you are, but they care about what you possess. They will take what you possess, even at the cost of your life. That is what robbers do. Are you a robber on the road to Jericho? Have you robbed some people emotionally, socially? Economically, psychologically, spiritually, financially, physically, and in many other ways. What have you robbed from other people? Have you taken the possessions of some people? Have you attacked, stripped, beaten, and wounded some people and left them half dead on the side of the road to Jericho? Are you one of the robbers? Next, we look at the priest. The priest was going down the same road as the wounded man. He saw the man, but passed by. On the other side. One of the primary roles of the priest. Was to sacrifice animals. For the sins of the people. To the people listening to Jesus. As he told the parable of the good Samaritan. The priest was a good man. In fact one of the best. Surely they expected that he would help the wounded man. The priest saw the man. He could not claim ignorance of the man. And his situation. Neither could he pretend that he did not see him. All the characters in the parable. Saw the man. The priest saw the wounded man, but passed by on the other side. Now some people say the priest was perhaps too occupied with his priestly duties to help the wounded man. Some people say maybe the priest was rushing to do his personal business. Some people say perhaps the priest did not help the wounded man because of the rules concerning touching dead bodies. 
Hence, he thought the wounded man was dead, and the rules deterred him from touching the dead body. The Old Testament spells out strict rules on touching dead bodies. To understand the rules, read the book of Numbers chapter 19 and Leviticus chapter 21. In Numbers chapter 19, from verse 11 to 13, we have these words. Whoever touches a human corpse will be unclean for seven days. They must purify themselves with the water on the third day and on the seventh day. Then they will be clean. But if they do not purify themselves on the third and seventh days, they will not be clean. If they fail to purify themselves after touching a human corpse, they defile the Lord's tabernacle. They must be cut off from Israel. Because the water of cleansing has not been sprinkled on them, they are unclean. Their uncleanness remains on them. Yes, there were rules regarding touching dead bodies. However, that is not why the priest did not help the wounded man. The priest did not help the, the man on purpose. He ignored the man, not because of the rules concerning touching dead bodies. He ignored the man on purpose. Are you the priest? Have you ever met people who were stripped, beaten, wounded, and left half dead on the highway of life, but passed by? On the other side, are you so concerned about heavenly matters that you don't have time to do earthly good? Are you too concerned about heaven to be useful and helpful to people on earth? Are you so focused on your religious duties that you're of no use to the people stripped, beaten, wounded, and left half dead on the highway of life? Are you so preoccupied with your own destiny that you don't have time to help other people? As a Christian, you cannot be too preoccupied with your Christianity to help those who are stripped, beaten, wounded, and left half dead in life. Are you the priest? Have you ever walked past those who needed your help and you could help them? The priest did not consider the fact that it could have been him who could have been stripped, beaten, wounded, and left half dead on the road to Jericho. What happened to the wounded man could have actually happened to the priest. On the highway of life, some people will come and find you stripped, beaten, wounded, and left half dead. But they will pass you by on the other side. Be careful not to walk past those who need help. Be careful not to ignore those in need. Be careful not to pass by people, yet you can help them. What happens to someone can also happen to you. The depression someone experiences, you can experience it as well. The disappointment someone goes through can also happen to you. The abuse that happens to someone can also happen to you. Holy as you may be, pure as you may be, clean as you may be, prayerful as you may be, busy as you may be, religious as you may be, spiritual as you may be, righteous as you may be, you are not immune to problems. Life is dynamic. Never approach it with a static mindset. Some people live as if the tragedies that befall other people can never befall them. <laughs> In life, no one is immune to problems. Never laugh at the wounds of another man, for you could sustain those wounds yourself. Never laugh at the tears of another man, for you could be the next person to shed tears. Never laugh at the fire that guards your neighbor's house, for your house could be the next. Never mock a pain that you haven't endured. Never laugh at, at other people's scars, for you could sustain those scars yourself. Learn from other people's scars. The ascended people have a wisdom pregnant, knowledge filled, and power packed soul awakening, life changing, and thought provoking proverb that says, By the time the fool has learned the game, <laughs> the players have dispersed. Ha! What a proverb! My own people, the actually people say, Oluango maming, ayege yuko kiliel. Oluango maming, ayege yuko kiliel. It means, it is a foolish fly that is buried with a corpse. It is a foolish fly that is buried with a corpse. The wise learn from the mistakes of other people, but fools never learn from the mistakes of other people but make the mistakes themselves. The wise learn from the situations of other people, 
But fools never learn from the situations of other people and get into those situations themselves. In verse 37, the wise learn from the scars of other people. But fools never learn from the scars of other people and get the scars themselves. If you don't learn from the scars of other people, you may get the scars yourself. Worse still, you may never live to tell your story. That's how bad things can be. Do you learn from the scars of other people? Do you learn from the situations of other people? Do you learn from the mistakes of other people and avoid the mistakes? What happened to the man on his way to Jericho from Jerusalem could also happen to the priest. Yet the priest walked past the man. The priest surely appeared good in the temple. Yet he walked past the half-dead man on the road. There are modern-day priests, pastors, and ministers who appear good in the church. That will see you stripped, beaten, wounded, and left half-dead on the road. And walk, ride, or drive past you. Are you the priest on the road to Jericho? Are you so caught up in a religion that God has no place in your life? Are you so focused on religion that kindness is not in your vocabulary? Are you so strict on performing your religious duties that you have no time to perform acts of mercy to those who are stripped, beaten, wounded, and left half dead on the road of life? Does religion matter more to you than the people of God? Are you so consumed by religion that you do not even know God? Is your life so engulfed by religion that you have no room for the Holy Spirit to lead you? Are you so conservatively religious that you are of no use to the people you encounter who need your help? Are you so concerned about purity that you don't show pity to people? Are you more concerned about being holy instead of showing mercy to the people of God? Are you more concerned about self-righteousness than showing mercy to other people? Are you the priest on the road to Jericho? Next, we look at the Levite. Now, the Levites were from the tribe of Levi, son of Jacob, but not the family of Aaron. Therefore, they were not from the priestly family. They assisted in the temple. They were closely connected to the priesthood because they assisted in the temple. The Levite on the road to Jericho also saw the wounded man, but just like the priest passed by on the other side. Some people say the Levite did not help the wounded man because of the rules concerning touching dead bodies, which are found in Leviticus chapter 21 and Numbers chapter 19. However, just like the priest, the Levite ignored the wounded man on purpose. The heartlessness of the priest and the Levite stands out even more, given that they were seen to be very close to divinity, for they both served in the temple. The Levite assisted the priest in the temple. The priest, therefore, was his master. The Levite met the wounded man and saw him, but just like his master, passed by on the other side. A bad priest will most likely have a bad assistant. A bad priest will most likely have a bad Levite. A corrupt boss cannot work with an assistant who opposes corruption. A bad person cannot hire a good person for an assistant. A dishonest man cannot work with an honest man as his assistant. A crooked man cannot successfully carry out his crooked activities with an uncrooked assistant. It is therefore not surprising that the Levite, the assistant to the priest, did exactly what the priest did. Be an emulator of good, not evil. Where your leader has done bad, do good. Where your leader has left a gap, close the gap. Where your leader has not acted rightly, act rightly. Where your leader has been insensitive, be sensitive. Where your leader has been unkind, be kind. Where your leader has been unloving, be loving. Don't copy bad examples. Copy good examples. Who is your priest? Whom do you assist as they execute their activities? Have you been following your priest? How have you been following your priest? Have you been following bad teachings? Do you do just like your priest even when he does something bad? Mind whom you follow. 
man whom you assist, man whom you work with. It is good to follow your pastors, priests, or leaders. However, don't follow them blindly. Be open-minded. Do not do bad things just because they do them. Let doing good be your nature. Good is good, even if no one is doing it. While bad is bad, even if everyone, everyone is doing it. Never follow anyone blindly in life. Where your leaders do bad, do good. Be an emulator of, of good, not bad. Most importantly, follow God. In verses 1 and 2 of the 5th chapter of his letter to the Ephesians, Apostle Paul wrote, Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Wow. Are you an imitator of God? The Levite, do you walk in love? Do you show mercy to other people? The Levite acted just like his master, the priest. He never helped the wounded man, yet he had the opportunity to help. Are you the Levite? Now let's look at the Good Samaritan. He was also going down the same road as the wounded man. Jesus illustrated the Samaritan's willingness to help the wounded man and the extent of his lavish love to show how much he had compassion for the wounded man. Notice carefully the specific things the Good Samaritan did. The Good Samaritan saw the wounded man. He took pity on him. He stopped. He went to the man. He bandaged his wounds. He poured oil on the wounds to soothe the pain. He poured wine on the wounds to disinfect them. He put the man on his own donkey. He took the man to an inn from where he would recover. He took care of him. He stayed with the man throughout the night. He didn't stop there. The next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. He deposited money for taking care of the wounded man for multiple days. He also committed to the innkeeper to repay whatever the innkeeper would spend on the wounded man. In verse 35, he said, Look after him when I return. I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. The good Samaritan was seriously concerned about the long-term well-being of the wounded man. What a man. This is the kind of man the world is in dire need of today. Are you the good Samaritan? Have you ever been concerned about the long-term well-being of someone? Have you ever met stripped, wounded, beaten, and half-dead people on the highway of life? Have you ever taken pity on them? Have you ever gone to them? Have you ever bandaged their wounds? Have you ever poured oil and wine on their wounds? Have you ever put them on your donkey? Have you ever taken them to an inn? Have you ever taken care of them? Have you ever stayed with them the whole night? Have you ever taken out two denarii and given them to the innkeeper and told him to look after the wounded people? And when you returned, you would reimburse him for any extra expense. Are you a modern day good Samaritan? The parable of the good Samaritan goes beyond a man helping a foreigner. It is well known that in those days, the Jews and the Samaritans hated one another. They did not associate with one another. They had a long history of, of dissension, hatred, and bitterness. Go and cut out a research to understand that history. A Samaritan would not have touched a Jew any more than a Jew would have wanted to be touched by a Samaritan. So, the use of the Samaritan in the parable by Jesus should be appreciated. Given the hatred between the Jews and the Samaritans, it was not expected that the Samaritan would help the Jew. Yet he had compassion for the afflicted Jew. He showed true love for his broken condition as he helped him. He even promised to return. My God, what a man. Have you ever had compassion for your enemies? Have you ever been helped by your enemies? Have your haters ever had compassion for you? The good Samaritan stopped and got off his donkey and went down to the wounded man. There is something worth noting here. If you are in a high position, get down from that position. 
and go to where those who need your help are. Those who need your help are down there. Go down to them. Reach out to them. Touch them. Help them. Comfort them. Stand with them. Pull them up. Don't remain up on your donkey. Yet the wounded people are down. Go down to them and then help them. You cannot help people when you're when you're high on your donkey of pride and self-importance. You must go down in humility and compassion and help those who are down. Those who are stripped, beaten, wounded, and left half dead don't have the strength to come up to you. If you must help them, then you must go down to them. Touch them, feel their pain, comfort them, examine their wounds, disinfect their wounds, pour wine on the wounds, pour oil on the wounds, bandage the wounds, and then carry them on your donkey and take them to an inn. Get down from your high academic, social, economic, religious, or political position and go down to the community and help the people. Carry the people up. Somewhere down there, some people are downtrodden. Somewhere down there, some people lack what to eat. Somewhere down there, some people are looking for opportunities. Somewhere down there, some people are suffering from depression. Somewhere down there, some people are sick. Somewhere down there, some people are being persecuted religiously, politically, culturally, mentally, psychologically, socially, economically, and in many other ways. Somewhere down there, some people are seen as outcasts. Somewhere down there, some people have lost their marriages. Somewhere down there, some people have lost their loved ones. Somewhere down there, some people have lost hope in life. Somewhere down there, some people are just waiting to die. Somewhere down there, many orphans have no one to call mother or father. Somewhere down there, some people lack directions for their lives. Somewhere down there, some people need Jesus. Somewhere down there, some people are down in many, 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 many ways. Will you get off your donkey and go down there and help the people? Will you lift those people up? Will you put them on your donkey? Will you take them to an inn? Will you take care of them? Will you sacrifice your comfort for their comfort? Will you sacrifice your resources so that they may recover from their wounds? Remember, they are stripped, beaten, wounded, and left half dead. On the highway of life therefore they are extremely weak while you are strong what will you do to help them are you the good samaritan on the road to jericho the good samaritan surrendered discomfort to the wounded man he put the man on his donkey and he walked as he led the man to an inn will you ever put those who are stripped beaten wounded and left half dead on your donkey Will you walk so that they may sit on your donkey? Will you lead them to an inn while they ride your donkey? The good Samaritan sacrificed his resources to save the life of the wounded man. What a man. Have you ever sacrificed your resources to save the life of someone who was stripped, beaten, wounded, and left half dead on the highway of life? Are you a modern day good Samaritan? You will remember that when we were stripped, beaten, wounded, and left half dead by sin, Jesus Christ himself came down to us. He got off his donkey and came to us. For we were down. He didn't help us while on his donkey. He had compassion for us and came down here and walked with us, ate with us, lived with us, touched us, poured oil and wine on our wounds, bandaged our wounds, fed us, comforted us, encouraged us, mended our broken hearts, restored our lost hope, helped us, loved us, taught us, died for us, cleansed us. Just like the good Samaritan, he put us on his donkey. He even promised to come back and take us to himself. What a great man to emulate. While this is a great analogy to what the good Samaritan did, it is not the main point of the parable. As you have already seen. I hope you remember the main point of the parable. 
it is very important to note that immediately after the Good Samaritan met the wounded man, he changed his priority. His immediate business became helping the wounded man. He suspended what he initially set out to do for the sake of the wounded man. He surely did not set out on the road to Jericho to go and help the wounded man. He had his business, but he suspended his business to attend to the wounded man because there was a life to save. What a man. Have you ever suspended your activities because you met a wounded man whose life was at stake? Have, have you ever put aside your activities to attend to someone in need? Have you ever sacrificed your priorities to help someone who was stripped, beaten, wounded, and left half dead on the highway of life? The Samaritan took the wounded man to an inn. He didn't rush to go away. After reaching the inn, he stayed with the wounded man the whole night. He took care of the man that night, for the whole night. Before he left the next morning, he instructed the innkeeper. He gave him two denarii and said he would return and pay any extra expense that the innkeeper would incur while taking care of the wounded man. The Samaritan would surely keep his word. Otherwise, who trust he who does not keep his word? Can you be trusted because of your words? Do you keep your words? When you speak, can people believe that you will fulfill what you say? Do people know you as someone who keeps his word? When the good Samaritan told the innkeeper that he would return and pay any extra expense, it was like he gave the innkeeper a blank check. The innkeeper could tell the good Samaritan any amount to extract money from him. The good Samaritan exposed himself to being exploited. But what he did demonstrated the nature of his love. What is the nature of your love for God? What is the nature of your love for man? Are you a modern day good Samaritan? Today, there are very many people who are stripped, beaten, wounded, and left half dead on the highway of life. They have various kinds of wounds. Emotional wounds, psychological wounds, financial wounds, political wounds, relationship wounds, cultural wounds, physical wounds, mental wounds, and social wounds, among others. What will you do to the wounds? Will you pour wine on the wounds to disinfect them? Will you pour oil on the wounds to soothe the pain? Will you bandage the wounds? Will you pour wine and oil on corruption? Will you pour wine and oil on hatred? Will you pour wine and oil on tribalism? Will you pour wine and oil on nepotism? Will you pour wine and oil on conflicts? Will you pour wine and oil on discrimination? Will you pour wine and oil on child abuse? Will you pour wine and oil on wars? Will you pour wine and oil on social, racial, political, religious, cultural, and economic discrimination? Will you pour wine and oil on inhuman treatment? Will you pour wine and oil on the emotional wounds of others? Will you pour wine and oil on the social wounds of others? Will you pour wine and oil on the psychological wounds of others? Will you pour wine and oil on the financial wounds of others? Will you pour wine and oil on the physical wounds of others? Will you pour wine and oil on all kinds of wounds of others? Are you a modern day good Samaritan? Finally, we look at the innkeeper. He welcomed the wounded man and the good Samaritan. He was hospitable. He provided refuge to the wounded man and the good Samaritan. He took the instructions of the good Samaritan. The wounded man was left in his care. He was entrusted with taking care of the wounded man. He was told to spend his resources while taking care of the wounded man and he would be reimbursed. What a man. How hospitable are you? Do you receive the stripped, wounded, beaten, and half-dead people? Who are brought to you? Do you provide refuge to them? Do you take instructions from those who bring them to you for taking care of them? Can they be left in your care? Are they safe and secure in your hands? Can you nurse their wounds with love? Will you not abuse them? Will you not add salt to their wounds? Will you not keep reminding them of their past traumatic experiences? Can you be entrusted with taking care of those who need help? Can you spend your own resources? To take care of the wounded. Even if you will be reimbursed. What about if you will not be reimbursed? 
Can you still use your own resources to take care of those who are wounded? Have you ever provided refuge to those who are stripped, beaten, wounded, and left half dead on the highway of life? The innkeeper took in the wounded man and took care of him. Are you the innkeeper? We have sufficiently examined the characters of the parable of the Good Samaritan. For us to properly find ourselves in this parable, we need to examine ourselves with unprecedented sincere honesty. What would you have done if you had met the wounded man on the road to Jericho? How would you have treated the man? Would you really have had compassion for the man? What kind of Christian are you? Are you a modern day good Samaritan? How do you treat other people, especially those who are in need? Are you a modern day good Samaritan? I hope you examined your life honestly as we examined the characters of the parable of the good Samaritan. Where do you belong? Who are you in the parable? Are you the man going down from Jerusalem to Jericho? Are you one of the robbers? Are you the priest? Are you the Levite? Are you the good Samaritan? Are you the innkeeper? But as we may be, good as we may be, wicked as we may be, holy as we may be, pure as we may be, and clean as we may be, poor as we may be, rich as we may be, educated as we may be, illiterate as we may be, low as we may be, high as we may be, we all need good Samaritans in our lives. The question is, are you one? The great Mahatma Gandhi is said to have said, be the change you want to see in the world. The immediate question is, what change do you want to see in the world? You cannot be the change without showing mercy to other people. You cannot be the change without helping other people. You cannot be the change without bandaging other people's wounds. You cannot be the change without pouring wine and oil on, on other people's wounds. You cannot be the change without showing love to other people. You cannot be the change without being there for other people. You cannot be the change without reaching out to those who are down. You cannot be the change while operating from your donkey. You cannot be the change without taking care of those who are stripped, beaten, wounded, and left half dead on the highway of life. You cannot be the change without taking the wounded on your donkey. You cannot be the change without taking the wounded to an inn. You cannot be the change without humbling yourself. You cannot be the change without restoring the hope of other people. You cannot be the change without encouraging other people. You cannot be the change without serving God and humanity. You cannot be the change without wiping the tears of those who are crying. You cannot be the change without feeding those who are hungry. You cannot be the change without clothing those who are naked. You cannot be the change without visiting those who are in prison in their journey through life. You cannot be the change without being the change you want. To be the change, you must be the change. The good Samaritan was the change he wanted to see in the wounded man. Are you a modern day good Samaritan? Today the world is in short supply of compassionate people. Be one. The world is in short supply of encouragers. Be one. The world is in short supply of those who restore hope. Be one. The world is in short supply of those who stand with others. Be one. The world is in short supply of those who sacrifice for others. Be one. The world is in short supply of those who love others unconditionally. Be one. The world is in short supply of those who love God with all their hearts and with all their souls and with all their strength and with all their minds. Be one. The world is in short supply of those who love themselves. Be one. The world is in short supply of those who love their neighbors as themselves. Be one. The world is in short supply of those who show mercy to others. Be one. The world is in short supply of those who sow what they want to reap. Be one. The world is in short supply of good Samaritans. Be one. In your life's journey, you will meet different kinds of people. Some will shape your destiny. Some you will shape their destiny. Some will laugh with you. Some will cry with you. Some will help you to achieve your dreams. Some will fight your dreams. Some will feed you. Some you will feed. Some will push you forward. Some will pull you backward. Some will push you up. Some will pull you down. Some will provide shoulders for you to lean on. Some will lean on your shoulders. Some will look up to you. Some will look down on you. Some will count on you. Some will count you out. Some will love you. Some will hate you. Some will laugh with you. Some will cry with you. 
Some will encourage you. Some will discourage you. Some will fight for you. Some will fight against you. Some will be your friends. Some will be your enemies. Some will cry with you. Some will cry for you. Some will pray for you. Some will pray against you. Some will work for you. Some will work against you. Some will wish you well. Some will wish you bad. Some will wish you life. Some will wish you death. Some will be robbers to you. Some will be priests to you. Some will be Levites to you. Some will be good Samaritans to you. Some will be innkeepers to you. The question is, what are you to other people? We are all on the Jericho Road. The contemporary Jericho Road is the place where knife crime is on the rise. Where loneliness is endemic. Where poverty is on the increase. Where racism is widespread. Where people are sleeping on the streets. Where people are hungry where people are naked, where people are imprisoned, physically and mentally, where there is violence, where there is oppression, where there is the discrimination, where people are robbed of that dignity, where people are robbed of love, where people are robbed of food, where people are robbed of freedom, where people are cheated, where people are denied justice, where people are living in despair, where people are stripped, beaten, wounded, and left half dead by poverty, persecution, broken relationships, Loneliness, injustice, discrimination, corruption, and wars, among others. Where people are stripped, beaten, wounded, and left half dead socially, politically, economically, psychologically, physically, culturally, religiously, and spiritually, among others. The question is, where are you on the road to Jericho? The question is, what are you doing on the road to Jericho? The question is, who are you on the road to Jericho? The question is, how are you treating people on the road to Jericho? The question is, are you a modern day good Samaritan? God bless you. 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 God bless you.